Eh, hola, estoy llegando un poco tarde, como todos se pueden haber dado cuenta. And I've got to switch to English, as I promised. So I'm looking up what we were doing last time. So I know that we were doing some Uniprot stuff. So this time I got a carry on with that but not only carry on but I want to make sure that we have a little bit more context um, of course if you have taken the time to explore Uniprot it, it turns out that it's pretty pretty useful pretty nice <coughs> and it offers lots of, of things that you can take advantage of so I'm going back here and take on a slightly different approach to what we can do with Uniprot. So for starters, um, let's go back to the search uh, I have presented to you before, which was hemoglobin. And we can actually, sh I should, I want, what I want to do is follow this other pattern of how to interact with Uniprot. In the original pattern, what I showed you, uh, among the many things that I showed you was the inclusion of a cytochrome C in this uh, comparison of glowing light proteins, as well as this, as well as myoglobin and neuroglobin which is a, a version of hemoglobin that I haven't heard of before, but still sounds like something interesting. And as many questions in research, it might be interesting to find out what that other form, what that, that other globin is about. We did a little bit of work on <coughs> Um, how to obtain phylogenetic trees, or at least to relate sequences among themselves. For example, in the case of these globin-like proteins, how related is the cytochrome C to all of the globins, only myoglobin, for example, or all of the hemoglobins that are compared here. <coughs> And then what happens if we remove proteins that are very distant in, distant in terms of evolution? So we did that and we got a couple of interesting results. They might not be outstanding. That is something that you will just type into a paper and publish. But they were suggestive of different properties of the enzymes. Uh, one uh, characteristic that captured my mind was that well that there is in fact another protein that is not hemoglobin that seems to be a very specific form of a oxygen binder in the neurons. That really sounds interesting and I would like to explore that a little bit more. But as well, many questions will arise in the context of that idea or experiment, if you, re if you will, is where do we start? So as a 
computational biologist, I will start back again in the sequence. Here in the uniprot, we have the sequence of the protein, and here we have several pieces of information. The location, for example, for me, this is really astonishing. That is, that it's a mitochondrial version of hemoglobin. Although it makes sense, I, I really didn't think something like that should exist or will exist. And that prompts me to think about many questions about this protein. So, just to be general about these questions, what could arise is how does it get into the mitochondria? Or rather, is it a nuclear gene or a mitochondrial gene? If it's a mitochondrial gene, how is it translated? How a protein, I mean, it's it's easy to imagine a protein being translated in the mitochondria. There's mitochondrial ribosomes. The mitochondria has some tRNAs. There's RNA. There's protein translation in the mitochondria. But the most inter interesting aspect there will be how is that heme group attached to the protein once folded? But that's not only a problem of a protein synthesizing the mitochondria, it's gonna happen too if the protein is a nuclear gene. The nuclear gene has to be expressed, translated, and assembled with the heme. And it, does that happen before getting into the mitochondria or after getting into the mitochondria? So that that is an, a, a whole kind of worms, as some will say. And sometimes Uniprot can be uh, really helpful about it. I don't see, for example, in this um, section, PTM and processing, that the protein contains a, a signal recognition sequence, which in for proteins that are going into the mitochondria is usually um, alpha helix with a lot of positively charged residues. It's not identified in the post -translate tra for translational modifications. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Mm, notice this. This is something that I was uh, looking at in the structure. I don't know if you remember last time I tried to figure this out. According to the annotations in the uniprot, the protein is a monomer, but can be a homodiver and a homotetramer. Disulfide linked which means that's a, that's a covalent interaction in this case. Oh, this is internal. So I wonder which one is this one. Okay, this has been identified by similarity. So there might be some question about that, if it's really uh, covalently attached. Yeah, you see, let me show you, since we are talking about this protein, cytochrome C, Cytochrome C, I think it's coded, coded in the nuclear genome and it's imported into the mitochondria. Let's see, PTM, yeah, mitochondrial gene, pathology, only the methionine is removed. So, well, it's clear, it seems that at least this globin like protein doesn't need a, a, um, a signal region in the sequence to be important in the mitochondria. And it's likely that because it's cytochrome C involved not only in the respiratory chain, but also in apoptosis, that the mechanisms for import and assembly are well known. And I seem to remember looking at a review ages ago. Uh, when I mean ages, I mean when I was doing my PhD around 2005. So that, that mechanism is well known and it's likely that this neuroglobin also follows a similar mechanism. It's not, if not the same transporters. Oops, sorry, <laughs> not my intention. Yeah, listen, well, I haven't thought of this before, but because 
uh, Uniprot is a protein sequence database. It does not show any information about where the gene for this protein is located. So that's something we are not going to be able to find here. Now, when we compare the hemoglobins with the cytochrome and neuroglobin, I seem to remember that neuroglobin, neuroglobin was more closely related to the hemoglobins to the cytochrome. However, since I have them in my basket, and I hope you have them too, if not, please look up these two entries. Or in fact, if you want to locate this again, um, they should be easy to locate. Let's see. If you don't didn't save your basket from a previous session, what I'm going to do is go back here and instead of hemoglobin, I'm going to type globin use the logic operator and and the species homo sapiens hmm sorry for the ing mistake globing and homo sapiens okay i'm gonna narrow it to the review ones and here we go we have neuroglobin hemoglobin maybe Maybe if I expand the list to a hundred items. And as I told you, sort them by alphabetical order. Cytoglobin, that's interesting. I don't see the cytochrome C. How do I find it? Did I add it later? Well, it will look like what I will advise you if you didn't have that list from before is find click on the neuroglobin and click on add to basket. So something like this. Click neuroglobin, add to basket. Then let's look for P99,999. P99. And this we can also add to basket, clicking right here. So by now you should have the same two sequences at least. I'm gonna just click here because I wanna exclude the rest and I'm gonna align them. So this is gonna be a very simple pairwise alignment. I'm gonna take the chance to say hello to anybody looking at this video. Seemingly there's at least one person. If you are there, send a message in the chat, say hello. Here, I'm saying hello there. Somebody's there, say hello. So, whoa, 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 look at this. Neuroglobin and cytochrome C are really very different proteins. There's huge gaps in the sequence alignment in such a way that, yeah, they are different, very different proteins. Maybe related, but if they were once part of a family, it was a long, long time ago. Okay, but that doesn't mean that they cannot be related structurally. And there is this concept called convergent evolution, that some proteins, even though they had different functions, they can have a similar structure. Here, for our purposes, we're going to have a little bit of a harder time getting the structures. But let's see if I can figure out. Figure out. So what I'm going to do is here on cytochrome C, if you want to get there, if you have this in your basket, you could uh, literally click here on the entry and we can go to structure mm, and given that i don't know much about this structure i'm gonna just go for this one we are expecting cytochrome c to be a monomeric protein and in fact, we should find that around here. Uh, this is again something that comes from cellu knowing cellular biology and bioenergetics. Hemoglobin should be a monomer. Here, of course, crystallization can create the appearance of 
cytochrome C being an oligomer, but I don't think there's any reason to expect it to be so. So I'm gonna go for this one, three set CF. I'm gonna li quite literally open the main chimera. If you remember chimera, chimera is a very useful program to manipulate structures. Here we have on file fetch by ID and quite literally I'm going to type 3 C F. Oh, okay. Here did we go. Yeah, this will be seemingly a tetramer, but I'm going to select just one chain invert that selection and erase the other structures so we have only this one and um, well i know this and i can give you a heads up cytochrome c as opposed to hemoglobin that binds oxygen has a histidine and a methionine in coordinating this ion so what this does is that it doesn't allow oxygen binding here but electron transfer via this iron center so this is cytochrome C. Let's find through the basket or an, any other mean, neuroglobin. You can use this code too. You can just select it, Q9NPG2, paste it over here, and you should arrive exactly to the same location. And under structure, we have several ones. I'm gonna go for this one because I think that even if it's a dimer or a tetramer, we can deal with just one subunit. So 4 MPM. Again, file fetch by ID, 4 MPM. If I didn't mistype that, we should be able to get, there we go. Um, yeah, I can see some of the differences on the neuroglobin being bigger. So here I can select the B chain, which should be only the neuro neuroglobin. And before doing something else, let's look closer to the neuroglobin. Can you see that the neuroglobin has an iron center in the skin group, but a histidine on top on the bottom, which should allow for this protein to bind oxygen. Let's uh, compare it to myoglobin. Why not? That will be a monomer, so it should be easy. So human myoglobin. Really, it's only one structure. So let's get it. File fetch three RGK. <coughs> Just checking the microphone. So here in pink, we have myoglobin. Oh, look at this one. Here is the one of the histidines, the heme, this is a single oxygen, but remember because electron microscopy, sorry, X-ray crystallography does not see protons. This could be a water molecule, right? Not oxygen, not uh, atomic oxygen. And for sure, not molecular oxygen, right? When you will need to see two of these red spheres. And we have the other histidine. Now this looks different than the neuroglobin. This looks as if this histidine is making a, a, a spot, making way for this oxygen. So to be able to appreciate appreciate how this looks better, that is, how do the binding sites or the heme groups compare? What I'm gonna do first is use the presets, change the presets to ribbons, then silhouette and rounded ribbon. This is gonna make this color scheme, uh, different colors for the proteins over a white background, which I usually prefer. And then under tools in structure comparison, what I'm going to do is try to make the structures match. What do I mean by that? I'm going to try to superpose them in such a way that the differences are easy to appreciate. What differences? Well, if, for example, one of them is not bending a finger or the other one is missing a part that it's present in the others things like that and for that i need to select a reference 
And I think I'm going to go with the myoglobin as a reference and the other two align to the myoglobin. Usually in Chimera, there's no need to modify the, well, the default sets, but sometimes it does make sense to do it. In this case, I only changed this uh, iteration limit, but it shouldn't lead to significantly different results. Not really. Now, this is interesting, whereas Neuroglobin was very clearly and easily aligned with myoglobin and the cytochrome C didn't. Over here, let's see. Chimera allows you to keep you tabs on what's what with this model pane. Three set CF, uh, it's uh, cytochrome C. 4 MPM is neuroglobin and 3 RGK it's gonna be or it's myoglobin. So I'm gonna make cytochrome C invisible. There we go. And here we can easily see the huge differences or at least apparent differences between these two proteins. Both do contain, oops, sorry for that. Let me, I'm going to try to further the, al the alignment, the comparison, by just selecting those two proteins. And I'm excluding the cytochrome C for now, but it doesn't seem to improve a lot. And then I'm going to select the heme groups here under select and residue. They have different names. They probably are different heme groups, chemically speaking. And setting the rotation of my model with the set pivot to just one of them. And let's try again. I'm not sure I did it. One residue heck, set pivot. Okay, that that should be enough. Yeah. So it's, it's fairly easy to see that there's the deviation deviations between the structures. They are similar, but they do not align perfectly, and so much so that one has this helix that separates a lot from the rest of the structure and that is what drives this histing away from the heme group whereas in the other which is the neuroglobin these two residues are really tightly bound to the iron in the heme group so like they imagine that this microphone was the heme group in this structure what we can see is that the histidines are really really blocking it Whereas, if we make myoglobin visible, you can see here that one is very close and the other is kind of far away, leaving space for the oxygen that it's bound in this structure. Now, there's other differences that are fairly easy to see, but this is probably the major with the most consequence. This region over here, it's also changed and overall, the two different proteins can be see clearly understood as having different functions. Myoglobin, I think we observe down here that it's in the cytosol, whereas neuroglobin, it's only located in the mitochondria according to the database. So it makes sense that structure is different, but also it could be different because of the conditions of the crystallization and then the impact of the conditions of the mitochondria, where mitochondria, when there's an active oxygen consumption, it's going to be pumping protons out of the mitochondrial lumen, uh, seemingly making it more basic and the exterior a little bit more acidic. Now let's try to do something with the cytochrome. I'm going to try again to align it, but only in relation to myoglobin. Yeah, it doesn't improve. I, I wonder if this region is the only region with homology between these two sequences. But even so, you can already see this difference. This heme group is, sorry, it's 
coordinated by a histidine and a methionine. This cytochrome C is tuned to be an electron transport, whereas this one is tuned to be, a, well, a water and oxygen transporter. In Chimera, it's also possible to perform sequence alignments, but for the time being, I, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to keep this cytochrome here. I'm just going to make it invisible. But we can com now can compare these two proteins, neuroglobin and myoglobin, with, what do you think, S human hemoglobin alpha? Should we go for that? Let's click on it. Here we have that section. Let's go straight to the structure. Now, hemoglobin has been really, really intensively studied, so there's going to be plenty of sequences. Some of those sequences, sorry, plenty of structures, and some of those structures are likely to have ligands, not only oxygen, but carbon monoxide, hydrogen peroxide, and many others affecting the way they interact. Yeah the way the protein interacts with the heme group as well as the histidine. So I really don't have a favorite, so I'm going to pick just the first one, 1A00, and we'll work with that. 1A00. And as you can see, what we got was a tetramer, so it mm, it's likely that we have as you should know from your biochemistry, an alpha-beta dimer. That is two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. I really don't know which is which, so I'm going to have to resort to the sequence. A, I'm going to presume A and B are different. I shouldn't, actually. I'm going to select the three, the four chains in this hemoglobin. And then here we can read that A is alpha and C is alpha. So if I erase everything but A, I should have the only the alpha spion. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to select the chain A for hemoglobin. Then I'm going to invert the selection on that model only, which would mean that no other subunits are going to be erased. I'm going to erase it. And then on the tools, sorry, in comparison, I'm going to make a match again. Hey, anybody in the comments? Drop me a line. I would like to hear about you. And this time I will align myoglobin and neuroglobin. Look at this. So all of them are subtly, subtly different. Let's uh, start backwards from hemoglobin alpha. So here we have hemoglobin alpha. Again, the pattern of the histidine residues here and here. Uh, an iron with a heme group. Uh, this is a water molecule again. I'm just placing the mouse tip in chimera over the moldy atom that I can see to find out what it is and it's identified there as HOH. And overall, we have this globin fold. I'm gonna turn on myoglobin. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna remove those sulfate groups. Those are probably present there because the proteins were crystallized in ammonium sulfate, so they have sulfate. And you can see that overall the protein is the protein, that is myoglobin and hemoglobin alpha, are pretty similar, both in length and in structure, except for this region that loses alpha helical structure. The rest is similar, very similar. Up close, however, we see some differences in the way the histidines are near the heme group as well as the iron. Over here, there's a histidine that's totally different between these two proteins, maybe sequence, not only sequence-wise, but also the relative positions. And let's finally add the neuroglobin. The neuroglobin, again, totally different. This, all of the residues in blue, all of the ribbons in blue belong to, belong to the neuroglobin. You can see that 
the histones are way closer to the iron center. So this neuroglobin, just because of that, will will simil will be more similar to the cytochrome C. I'm gonna go back to the cytochrome. It didn't align well, so we cannot just overlap them. But here in a, this protein that should be important for transport of electrons, what we see is the histidine is really close to the iron and instead of another histidine we have a methionine, a sulfur group doing the coordination. So that protein is unlikely to be transported oxy transporting oxygen. Hemoglobin, um, sorry just a second, uh -huh. hemoglobin clearly, well we know it transports oxygen, myoglobin does too, but this neuroglobin I don't know. Maybe there's something that triggers a conformational change that drives one of those histidines further away, like this. You can see here these helices that are not ex no, qu not quite the same, and the same here. They are aligned. Well, they are totally misaligned. They, they are going in different directions. So it's possible that inside the mitochondria, that neuroglobin it's bound to a ligand that affects these relative orientations, changing this protein for some, from something that not obvious that could bind some oxygen to something that can sense oxygen and further use that conformational change to trigger some biological response. Since we have Uniprot for that, let's, well, I'm gonna go back to my basket and gonna find the neuroglobin, this one, and I'm gonna go back to the the main page for the neuroglobin. I'm uh, just sorry. I'm gonna read again the function. Uh, I was reading it to myself. Involved in oxygen transport in the brain. Hexacoordinate globin displaying competitive binding of oxygen or the distal histidine residue to the iron atom, not capable of penetrating membranes. So that means it's trapped in the mitochondria. Deoxygenated form exhibits nitrate reductase activity inhibiting cellular respiration via nitrogen oxide binding to cytochrome C oxidase, involved in neuroprotections during oxidative stress may exert an anti-apoptotic activity, may, okay, so that, that is guessed, expected, but not certain, activity, anti-apoptotic anti activity by acting to reset the trigger level of mitochondrial cytochrome C release necessary to commit the cells to apoptosis. So several things have been going on that there's something that triggers a change in the structure to bind oxygen and maybe another change or even the same that could capture cytochrome C preventing the release during the initial steps of apoptosis, which sounds pretty cool. Mm. I wanted to see if there was, oh yeah, where is that disulfide one? Because that's another thing that could change very specifically within the mitochondria that is um, uh, an oxidase or a, a reductase could be changing those residues from, ah, uh, okay, yeah, so th there's, there's, okay, here's, there's a disulfide formed near biomology to one of those helices that should be separated. So you can picture that if you reduce the diso this disulfide bond, this could hypothetically be stretched out and then open, displacing the histidine in blue from the iron to a position that allows binding of oxygen. So that is totally compatible. And then we have this one over here, which could be the, uh, the one that's proposed to form dimers. Altosymmetry 
could be interesting. Let's let's see if we can reopen the original structure, which that was this one. Where is that structure? If you if something like this happens to you, that is that the protein that you're looking at disappears, just go to focus. Okay. Well, let's try again. Clear the selection and focus. There we go. So this is the original PDB. Let's find out where the cysteine residues are. Ah, I don't see how this could be a disulfide between molecules, but I could see how this could be a dimer. There's good symmetry here. Look at this helix. I'm going to rotate this uh, structure and you have the equivalent here. So there is like a rotational symmetry here. Very simple, but it could be totally real. I mean, biologically relevant. This is interesting. Ah, a, re a redox disulfide bond regulates the heme pocket coordination and the rate of... Uh, so this is what I was saying. I, I should have read it here, right? Instead of guessing from the structure. But then again, reading the structure is also an ability that is important to develop. Well, this is pretty cool. So anybody in the chat? Nobody in the comments? Oh, well. I'm going to have another candy. Yeah, I should, I should have apologized for coming in a little bit late. I was busy trying to uh, perform the uh, the acquisition of a piece of software, so I was distracted. So, apologies for being late. <sighs> yeah, I guess I'm gonna take a, the chance this time to show you something that could be useful in the long term. Chimera is very powerful. I like it a lot because it allows for many, many, many things to be done on structures. And one simple example, fairly simple I'd say, could be this. We can select a residue. Can you see that I selected it? There is a green aura and down here six atoms and five bonds can be selected. And I can go to tools, editing and mutate those residues. So both Uniprot and me concur that this disulfide m should be involved in regulation. So we could just test that, go to alanine and mutate it to alanine and later do run some simulations and see if this helix down here or even the whole region now that it's not tethered covalently with this disulfide, can open allowing the access of oxygen to that heme group, which could be amazing if it happens in a simulation. I don't think I have, well, I should teach you how to do that, right? So let's not do it right now, but it would be a nice hypothesis. Then again, a very interesting question is, how does that happen in the mitochondria? Is there a reductase there, an isomerase that breaks them down and allow them to separate? What triggers that? That's totally cool. Hmm. Well, I love it. Uh, well, do you think it's enough? Uh, should I stop? Anybody has any requests? Uh, I'm I didn't have that many things to, to show you today, but if you have questions, I'm more than willing to to answer or to test how Chimera works here. You know, I think I'm thinking that I should explain a little bit more about the visualization. 
probably not everybody has used Chimera and it's just me that I'm so used to Chimera that I'm not even thinking about what I'm doing. Uh, Chimera usually, when it comes to proteins, of course, likes to display most of the structure as helices. Well, helices and strands. The helices are pretty obvious. Hemoglobin does not have strands. That is, is an only alpha helix protein. And everything that could be relevant, because there's a ligand, because there's um, there's water, that is atoms that are not part of a protein, such as the heme group and these water molecules and the sulfates that I have already raised, uh, what you will see is those represented as sticks. So only the amino acids, the residues that are close to this molecule that is not a protein and the water is nearby are represented as sticks, are, re are represented as sticks. Then these cysteines that I selected via this menu based on what amino acid they are, what residue they are. I also show them, I highlighted them so uh, you could easily find them. As you can see, most of everything is represented like that. Even when we have several subunits, these are shown following this pattern. Uh, wow, where is what was that, the cytochrome C? Mm -hmm. Cytochrome C is also mainly alpha helical, but it contains these loops that are non-structured, or at least not in the same manner as a helix. And a proline, which is a little bit distorted because of the representation as a loop of this region. And that's it for proteins. Heli helices, loops, strands. If we were to have DNA, which I don't know if I have a code around here. Yeah, no, uh, that's um, that's a dengue protein, I think. But you can see that because there's molecules that are not proteins, we have see we see many sticks all over the place. But this is not a good example. Um, oh, ground menu. Let's see, I'm gonna close all of these proteins, all of these globins. And let me see if I can clearly recall. A protein that has DNA bound. No, that's not it. This one, oh well, I didn't mention this. When there's metals, involved in interactions with proteins, we see these purple lines. Those indicate the coordination. So this, what is this? This nickel atom is one, two, three, four, five, six hexa coordinated to the protein. Through these two histidines and what? Oh, this is not the protein. This is MLI. I don't know what this is, but this is probably a compound added to the crystallization mixture. So it's only three histidines, one aspartic acid that are making the coordination. But this aspartic and this histidine could probably complete it by changing the conformation of the protein. Uh, this looks like a transporter protein. Sorry, I, I just got curious. What is this? 5Q. 5Q7F. Oh, who knows? Nobody knows what this is. Such a shame. Anyway, but that's not the protein I was looking for. So then 5F7Q. Okay, yeah, I think that is the one I was looking for. Yeah, so here we have a larger protein and this one or these two proteins are bound to a DNA molecule. Here we can see these uh, strands for the protein structure, the helices, loops, and the DNA is represented as, represented as these steps as well as the exterior, uh, the exterior formed by the phosphate groups and the sugars with these ribbons. 
So these representations are not accurate to the atom level, but they will give you a very good idea of where the major group is, where is the, ma the minor group, and other properties of the double-stranded helix. I think that even if you have single-stranded RNA or other variations of nucleic acids, you should well, you should get this default representation in Chimera, which of course can be changed to accommodate all atoms, for example. This is a more almost Jurassic Park, Jurassic Park representation, and many other variations from this. The one you already seen, others representations with surface, molecular surface, and properties such as hydrophobicity. There's there's plenty plenty of variations here. Anyway, I think that should be all for this time, unless somebody cares to make a note in the commentary section. No? Anybody there? Am I alone here? Maybe? <laughs> well, let's stop right here. Next time, I'm going to repeat some of this analysis for sequence alignment, but strictly within Chimera, so I can show you how to have structures and sequences at the same time and then work from there to try to predict as well as analyze the properties of uh, different or similar proteins. Okay, well then, it's a pleasure to talk to you and I hope to see you soon. Peace. Oh, oh, did I do that? Sorry. I follow possum every hour. Yes. Pictures of possums. <laughs>